That was a nice move by Pipkins, taking it right to the rack himself. Wide open three, left wing, and it's good. Nylon, the dunk likes that, Matt. A three from the right side, and it's good! The one, Pipkins, go man, yet again. Hello, and welcome to The Flex. I'm Matt St. Jean. I'm Joe Howie. And we got a Friars win for you. This is three out of four now. The Friars have won. They beat Xavier tonight, 83 to 68. It just is a dominant performance, right from pretty much right from the opening tip. Xavier never led. Friars led for 99.4 percent of the game. I, I mean, there's it's basically all good things to say about this one tonight. Um, yeah, Matt, uh, this was a, a really, really well-rounded game from the Friars. I, I think it's pretty obvious that Noel Horkler was the man of the game or the man of the match, as we used to say uh, on the Providence rugby team. But Horkler, it was doing it all tonight, rebounding, scoring, dunking, blocking. I mean, this is the Noel Horkler that you recruited to, to PC for his fifth year transfer. Um, we've seen flashes of this the the past, what was it, four or five games leading into this. Yeah. And he, he kind of just sealed the deal here. Hopefully he can keep this momentum going because the next two are, are pretty daunting. But a really, really strong performance by Horkler. And you know what's funny is Horkler's performance actually shadows everyone else's because Duke was a, a rebound and an assist shy of a triple-double. Uh, Watson, Reeves, Bynum, Duke, and Horkler all store, uh, scored in double figures. Just a very, very well-rounded approach, a tip of the hat to the role players who really stepped up. Yeah, and this is, I mean, we talked at the beginning of the year, and this is kind of the, the barometer we're going to keep using about, like, the expectations for this team, and it was, all right, the starting five, and, and we're going to talk about the starting five right now because Gant was banged up when he played two minutes, no nickel, so, I mean, the starting five is all they had tonight, basically, and your starting five is supposed to be your leaders. You're supposed to have a guy who can set the offense, and David Duke is a, is a dynamic scorer, A.J. Reeves is a guy who can hit the three ball. Horkler is a guy who can rebound and also come out and hit the three ball. And Watson's a monster in the paint. What happened tonight? Bynum scores a nice 10 points, three assists, more assists than turnovers. And Duke is the type of scorer you wanted. He hits almost 50% of his shots. He hits his threes. Horkler, three of five from beyond the arc with nine rebounds. Reeves, three of five from beyond the arc. And Nate Watson, seven of 10 from the field. Also seven rebounds, and he got to the line twice. I mean, this right – when you put together the team, this is exactly what you expected, a team that was able to play very good offense. This is the most points they've scored in the game since the double overtime win against DePaul. That's double overtime. This is 83 points in regulation. That's a really, really good performance. Um, yeah, I, I mean – I'm going to quote John Fanta from our State of the Friars Address podcast. Um, he said that the the final six games of the season last year was the coaches, the coaching staff's vision for what they wanted that team to look like. It only took until that point for everything to fall into place. Um, I'm going to say this game is very similar benchmark. I won't say that this is going to start some six-game winning streak or anything like that because we do need to, to – to realize what this team was before this. But I think this game is the culmination of everything that you wanted to see this season. And, um, I mean, I guess I'll start in the backcourt. Obviously, Jared Bynum back played a gigantic role. It it seemed like with him running the point, everyone could ease into their positions a little bit. So much more relaxed. So much more relaxed. And, by the way, uh, we've talked about this a lot. David Duke is not a good point guard when he is – and – we, we've said David Duke's not a good point guard. Asterisk. He is not a good point guard when he is the only point guard on the floor. And that's no disrespect to Alan Breed because he's a freshman. And let's be fair, he's more of a combo guard. When David Duke is paired with a true point guard, i.e. Jared Bynum, i.e. Lawan Pipkins, i.e. Malik White, David Duke can share the role of point guard, but it allows him to score more easily. And we saw that tonight. He scored in double figures and nine assists. Yeah, when he's not it, when he's not forced into the role, he can play the role with ease and look what look at the outcome. 
Yeah, he just needs a little bit more space on the floor. David Duke is a gifted passer. His struggles at point guard had nothing to do with his passing. It has everything to do with the amount of pressure he receives both mentally and from defenders when there aren't scoring options. We talked about it. We did a little halftime live. Uh, and we're going to keep doing that. So make sure you tune in for those. But on that, we talked about there was a sequence in the first half where they had Watson on the baseline and Reeves in the corner. And Reeves, because Reeves is there, Watson doesn't get doubled. He's able to get to the line. This is the stuff we're talking about. It's spacing, guys in the right spot, which opens up shots everywhere else. And the other part of that is, like, Reeves, Reeves, Horkler, and Duke were all three for five from beyond the arc. What is that? That's three guys who are all going to hit that shot. The defense has to honor that in some way. And that opens up your looks underneath. That opens up what you got for Jared. I mean, your best five, the guys who are, I think, especially after tonight, I think Bynum's back in the starting line with next game. If this is your starting five the rest of the year, all five are putting up double figures. And that's exactly what you want. And yeah, it starts because they're all playing the basketball you want them to play and they play well together. It starts with David Duke at the top. Yeah, Matt, and when you look at the five that were on the floor, they're the five that have been in this program the longest. They're the same five that were here last season, given Bynum and Horkler didn't play last year, but Duke Reeves-Watson did. They were a very big part of that six-game run. And like I said earlier, this isn't anyone trying to imply or hint that we're going to go on some magical run right now, but it, it it's a sign of the ship turning in the right direction. And not to mention, these are all experienced guys. Like, you look at a guy like Greg Gant, or you look like at a guy like Chris Monroe, who have had sprinkled minutes here and there, to to ask one of them to to play these gigantic minutes and, and to play this daunting role, it, it, that's an unfair task. To ask Alan Breed to step in at the point guard and take over the offense, that's a very, very daunting task for a freshman. But to ask Noah Horkler, who's in his fifth year, that's yeah. not too big of a task. That's n- not a big task at all. To yeah, ask... And- and he carried Jared, the load. Yeah, yeah, he did. To ask Jared Bynum to do the same. I mean, obviously he's 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 not a fifth year, but he is a tra- a redshirt transfer. This is technically his third year on a college basketball team. Not a tall task. Duke Reeves Watson, we know they're capable. So, uh, as enjoyable and as fun as this game was, it should not be a surprise to anyone, even though it feels that way. This is what the coaching staff envisioned for this team, and. To see it tonight was very nice, and it was a lot of fun. But we also have to keep the perspective that we have two regular season games left, and the team is turning it on now. So hopefully we can build off this game and get the momentum rolling. But perspective. You have to win the next two games before you even start really thinking NCAA tournament. But we've been saying for a while now, and by we, I mean the Big East media in general, UConn's strongest case right now for the NCAA tournament is that they're a different team when James Booknight comes back. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the third game now that Jared Bynum has played, and they won the first game. This is the first one where he's played significant minutes and really been involved in the offense since he came back. And the Friars look different. The Friars win their next two games. They will have won four of five since Jared Bynum returned to the lineup. It would include a win over Villanova, which I was like, you can't pencil that in right now. But this is a hypothetical. If that happens, your case looks a little bit stronger, especially when you've got Seton Hall losing a game to Butler. And you've got all kinds of chaos around the conference. I mean, the bubble is wide open right now. And the Friars don't have the opportunity for a six-game win streak and to finish the regular season. But they do have the opportunity to win five of six down the stretch. And that's pretty good. Yeah, it, that's, it gets it gets you going in the right direction. It, it certainly does, and um, I won't say that Jared Bynum is our our savior, our Lawan Pipkins. Um, I think you're you're completely right. It helps a ton, and I mean a ton to have him on the court. The guys look a lot more relaxed when he's handling the point versus Duke. Um, but like like we we touched on earlier, when he is on the floor, everyone settles into their role, and there's a sense of comfort and relaxation while he's on the floor. So to have, to quote John Fanta, again, this game is very tough to play without a true point guard. Ours comes back, and slowly but surely, we start, you know, settling the the puzzle the puzzle pieces. That's a tongue twister. The puzzle <laughs> pieces start, into the Providence puzzle pieces start falling into place. <laughs> Say that 
Say that. Three times fast. What number is yeah. Horkler? Say that 14 times fast for <laughs> Horkler. But um, to your point, Matt, about other teams in the conference and the NCAA tournament, I think Xavier and Connecticut should swap spots right now. They're saying Connecticut's a bubble team and that Xavier has has a locked spot. Xavier is the biggest fraud of an NCAA tournament at-large team I can think of in the country. And that's not to to knock them or to discredit them because they did a fine job. They didn't do a great job. They did a fine job getting their wins, going on that early season run, and ensuring their NCAA tournament eligibility, meaning you have to play and complete 13 games. They hit that mark, and now it's – it's almost like COVID is their excuse for why they they have such a good co- or why they did excuse me why they formerly had such a good conference record. If if you if they walked into conference play with under let's say just for argument's sake with under fifteen games and they get that first round by that's almost not fair to the teams that have been through the ringer and who have played everybody. Xavier has not played Villanova. Have they played Creighton? I don't think so. Uh, they they did play Creighton once. They get Creighton again on Saturday, which. Oh, they oh do boy, get them again. that game becomes a real big one for them now. But it they, does. They blew, a, they blew a 22 to 9 lead against Creighton at o- right. Omaha the first You're time. right. I remember that now. But back to my point to, for all these analysts to be like, oh, Xavier's in. No, I think out of anyone in the conference, Xavier has the most work to do because they have so much ground to make up. The yeah. the fact that they wanted to come back from three COVID pauses and, you know, dance with the narrative that they're a, a tournament team is a little ridiculous. And obviously and not, not everyone good since they came back. <laughs> right. And obviously not every Xavier fan or, or administration employee is saying that. Obviously, we talked to Cap and, and Cap and his guys are well aware that there's work to be done. But you can sense from uh, some of the the more amateurish fans on Twitter that they thought Xavier was like one of the best in the Big East. Nuh-uh. The, the yeah. road only gets tougher for them, especially yeah. with the way they're playing. Yeah. And obviously they had no Nate Johnson tonight, which hurts things. But that's not – Nate Johnson doesn't make up that 15-point difference, that that 15-point margin of victory for the Friars. And Absolutely honestly, not. Xavier didn't Xavier didn't play a terrible game. The Friars came to play tonight. You said right there, they looked comfortable. I, I want to hammer that point home. This is the third time the Friars have had a long break coming into a game this season. First one, that road win at Seton Hall. The second one, that road win at Creighton. Now this big home win against Xavier. As of right now, they got a long gap before heading to St. John. They got a week gap before they go to St. John's next week. So they've played well when they get that time to prepare for an opponent and reset things. And, you know, the other thing they've played well in, those pink jerseys. God, I love the black, white, and pink. 4-0 in them. I actually, Matt, um, I'm wearing my pink t-shirt from the pink out the dunk game last year when we stormed the court and almost cost us the Seton Hall game. Hey, win is a win. I'm also wearing, as you've seen in person, my pink Patrick Star basketball shoes. So I normally don't wear these unless I'm playing basketball, but... You know, I was feeling like I'd change it up from the, the slippers that I wear for 12 hours a day. So I threw those <laughs> on tonight. Night. That's a good night for him right there. I, I think my pink Providence shirt, I don't think I, I got to figure out where I have that. And I'm pretty sure my pink one, I got the sleeves cut off that as a, a gym shirt somewhere. Probably tucked away in my attic. I, I didn't break that out for tonight. I stayed casual for the game. You know what? It worked. I, you know, and. Uh, everything worked for the Friars tonight. I mean, like we've been saying, this is the Friars team we dreamed of. If And I tweeted this during the game. If Providence plays like this, they're a top four team in the Big East. They haven't played like this consistently, but there's opportunities down the stretch. At the very least, if the Friars beat St. John's next time, have a respectable outing against Villanova and make a little bit of noise in the Big East tournament, win the games they're supposed to win, maybe get to Friday. This is an NIT team, which a disappointment, sure, but you put things together at the right time. Maybe you win the NIT. I mean, that could be fun. That's not not the goal no. you're hoping for. But no, that's not fun. That's not fun. Hey, it's better than what we were talking about a week ago uh, after that loss to UConn. This looks like a totally different team than the one that lost to UConn. I'm looking for a little bit of optimism here. I mean, this is the team played good basketball tonight. They did everything that this Friars team wants to do, and I mean, it was the make shots off. Look at the, look at the shooting percentages for, for the Friars. 
53% from the field, 52% from beyond the arc, 82% of their free throws. And let's see, they made 29 shots, 17 assists on 29 shots. So more than half of their baskets had an assist on them. Only 11 turnovers. You got a nice ratio there. I mean, this is like when we talked about how last Tuesday the Friars looked like they were uh, mid-major playing against the high conference team. How the turntables. We made Xavier look like a mid-major team tonight. Yeah, and um, I'm going to go back to something that I said back in January when what's-his-name hit that three-pointer with a tenth of a second left. I said we are the better team than Xavier. We we outplayed them. We, we outplayed them for 38, 38 and a half minutes that game. We outplayed Xavier, and we proved that we were the better team. They got, they got lucky, went on a run, and they hit – it's, it wasn't a lucky shot, to quote Kevin McNamara, but a fortunate shot. They hit a very fortunate shot, and it's not lucky because um, one of our they wings failed. Well. They executed that offensive set very well, and one of our wings failed to close out. So it was fortunate, not lucky. But we had that game won, and the, the commentators were talking about it all night tonight. Uh, what's his name? Nick Ba was, was all over it. We had the game won, and we lost it. So I personally... I, I thought this after that game. I thought this going into this game. I know that, and I knew that we were the better team than Xavier. It's just going into the game, you didn't know who was going to show up. The Providence team that played better than Xavier last time or the yeah. Providence team that's played like poop for the past month and a half. Yeah. Not to play the what-if game too much, but you really you look at the loss at Georgetown and that loss at Xavier. This Friars team manages to score four more points on the season <laughs> and I uh, win those two games and we're on the bubble. Yeah. Cause the Friars, I mean, are 12 and 11 and eight and nine in conference play that would switch to be 14 and nine and let me do some math, 10 and seven in conference play. That's pretty good. That, that's a, that's a big difference right now. And yeah, yeah. And obviously the, the way that you make up for that is you win the next two games. You beat St. John's to make sure you split with them, which is very winnable. And and this is a St. John's team that is falling a little bit right now. And you got to beat Villanova. And this is what the Friars have known all season. You have to play with the top dogs. You got to find a way to be. I mean, Seton Hall got swept by Villanova and Creighton. Now, when they lose some of these tough games, they're in a tough spot. Friars already have a game against Creighton. You pick up one against Villanova. You can go to the committee and say, hey. We beat, I mean, we beat Creighton without Jared Bynum. We managed to beat Villanova. That can offset some of these losses and give us a better-looking resume. Yeah, I think that um, that Georgetown game is a real killer. That game just sucked. But I think you're right, Matt. Um, Seton Hall is on a downward spot. Uh, not Seton Hall. Well, Seton Hall too. But St. John's is playing downhill right now. They're not looking as sharp and as dialed in as they were. Um I mean, they they just lost at home to DePaul, and it, De, DePaul is just a burning dumpster fire in hell right now. Like, Dave Lato is coaching with absolutely no urgency. Uh, I mean, it's a shame because Charlie Moore is really talented. Romeo Weems is really talented. Freeman Liberty is really talented. And Dave Lato is like, eh, I just got a contract extension. We can suck if we want. But um, long tangent, but I, I think St. John's is playing in the wrong direction, and – Unless we schedule some sort of non-conference matchup for Saturday, we'll have another week off before we play them. Yeah, another and the, week the last, for... Yeah, and, and the last time I checked, there weren't a whole lot of openings this weekend. I think it would be very tough for the Friars to schedule another game. So you're looking at next game, St. John's, and since the Friars played them, St. John's has lost three of four. And let's be honest. The St. John's team that showed up that day shot the lights out from the get-go, and that is not the St. John's team that they have been for most of the season. That was one of those. I mean, they came in and sold that. The Friars really didn't play that poorly. It was just St. John's hit everything um, and just ran up that lead about halfway through that first half, 10 minutes into that one. So that game is more than winnable for Providence next week. Oh, here we go. I got a, I got a number for you, Joe. I got a number for you. Let me hear it. Ken Palm just updated the uh, the rankings after that oh, Friars no. win. 
Providence oh, no. moved up from 78 to 69. <laughs> oh, God. Moving uh, up, baby. Uh, Moving up nine uh, spots. <laughs> Providence nah, and Marquette I'm... with the two wins tonight, just shooting up the Ken Bomb rankings. Well, you know why we shoot up the rankings? is because Xavier didn't play for so long, so they held such a high ranking. So by comparison, it, it looks like we just knocked off one of the best teams in the conference. When really, I think Xavier deserves to be in our spot, if not lower. Hey, but you know, I, I'm not going to complain with that. I mean, moving up like that. No, I'm not. Gonna, I'm not going to complain either. I'm just. <laughs> I'm very resentful of the Big East this year. I don't know why. Yeah, that, that's the problem with the way the Big East is looking. <laughs> there aren't quality wins left. Like the, the to get an, to get the quality wins necessary to make it into the tournament, the Friars might have to win the Big East championship just to get those opponents because right now if you beat Seton Hall in the tournament might not get you in you beat Xavier again in the tournament not, that's not going to do it I think the the only th- like the Friars I think could make the tournament without winning the Big East championship if they beat Villanova at the end of the regular season and then beat one of Villanova Creighton or UConn in the Big East tournament at some point I think that's what um, they would do. yeah talking what ifs I was I'm pretty much on the same page with you. I think well just full blatant honestly, I don't think we can lose at all in the regular season. We lose against St. John's, we automatically will finish that's conference tough. play under five hundred and you'll be swept by a St. John's team that was fifty fifty all year. Yeah. I think you really you need to win out. A loss against Villanova doesn't really hurt you too badly, but it, it helps you tremendously. You need to win out and you need to make it to championship Saturday of the Big East hey, tournament. Hey Joe, we gotta we gotta take something back here. Uh Ed Cooley said in the post game press conference, as we were just talking, it's a possibility that PC could play a game this weekend and that there's a better chance they play now based on tonight's result. Um so Nick Ba during the broadcast said there was an opportunity for a potential non-conference opponent scheduled for this weekend, which is why I brought that up. Um, do you, are you thinking what I'm thinking? You are, I. What's their schedule like this weekend? Let me. Uh, there's, there's no. Here's the thing. It would be so you are I to have the opening this weekend and say no because they don't want us to get in. Uh, they have a game. Yeah, it's honestly, I. I I don't know who the Friars would play. I, it's t- I'm not even going to try to comb through all of the Power Six schedule for Friday through Monday to figure out who's open. But it's like Duke or someone. That would be an inter- I think the ACC is pretty jam packed in their schedule right now. I don't think that's going to be an option. Or you know, honestly, what I would love, like like a Syracuse, like a Louisville, like an old Big East opponent matchup. I have a feeling it would probably be a, lo- a somewhat local opponent. I, I don't know if we're going to. We would be willing to travel down to UNC like Marquette just did. You know well, what? Marquette traveled to UNC so Wojo could pretend that he was Coach K for the night. <laughs> let's let's I still, be I honest. I cannot here. believe they won that game. Everyone in the one that was uh, man. I, uh, you know what? It sucks for both teams because Marquette. Uh, all we can speculate all we want about the Friars. Marquette needs to win the Big East tournament if they want to make the NCAA tournament. So this win doesn't really do anything for them. UNC is on the bubble. So this game hurts them. So both this win, yeah, yeah, it's rah-rah, it's fun for Marquette. But guess what? It doesn't do you any any justice. All it does is just pad another game on your resume that ultimately doesn't matter unless you win March 13th. So this is that Marquette winning that game just hurts both of the teams. Oh, yeah. Uh, I don't think there's anybody in the ACC that's going to be available this weekend, taking a look at their schedule. So I don't think that's going to be it. To be honest, I don't know if the Friars want to play a Big Ten team right now, the way they're playing. I don't know if you're going to get a Big Ten team that you have a shot against right now. See, here's the thing, though. I don't want us to pick up a game against, like, a Brown or a Bryant and lose it. Because that just makes us look ten times worse. You know what I mean? Yeah. At this point, you're probably just looking for a win. Uh, I, I think there's going to be some teams open in the Big Ten this weekend. There's not a whole bunch of games there, so they could go that route if they wanted to. I, I really would not be shocked if they're looking at a lower-tier team 
to see if they can basically get a buy game right now and kind of get a tune up, add an extra win. That wouldn't shock me. Uh, this Whoa. is this is crazy though. All this stuff going on in college basketball. This is not something you typically see. You you know what would be interesting is if we get like a low major conference game this weekend and we reinsert Jared Bynum into the starting lineup and we start you know poking around with his minutes because I think if I'm gonna read into the one line that Cooley said um, that you just mentioned about a um, a game after after tonight's performance a game would be possibly in the works for this weekend I I can imagine that he wants Jared Bynum to be at full speed for St John's and Villanova and I think a we a low major opponent would be the best game for him because it's not a game that's going to tax him too much and it's just really a, a get right game yeah and yeah and the, the team looks right right now you just gotta get even more way. right yeah you gotta try i mean and if they if they schedule a game this weekend and it's a win and then you win out you beat st john's you beat villanova all right now now it's you won six now, or seven to finish the season and then you got that magic six game number <laughs> Not, not not only the six game number, but I think you, you're look you're feeling a little more confident going into Madison Square Garden. Yeah, yeah, and that's always big. Uh, and the other thing, like you want to look at these biggie standings right now. So the Friars are tied with St. John's at the moment, eight and nine record in conference play. It's also done by that percentage. If the Friars win out. They I think that should put them ahead of St. John's. Um, well, I, let's see. They'll have a win over St. John's, and they'll split with them. And as St. John's plays seat, you know, St. John's could easily lose out. If the Friars win out. They should be ahead of St. John's bare minimum. They'll be above 500. That should guarantee that they're in the top six. If Xavier, Xavier still has three games, Creighton, Georgetown, and Marquette. If they go one and two in that stretch, they're below 500. If that's how this plays out, and the Friars do win out. The Friars are top five in the Big East finish. And that means you get the bye you're not playing on Wednesday. I don't know if that's a good thing. Playing on Wednesday might actually be a good thing for the Friars this year because you can get an extra win <laughs> and um, bump up that win total on your, your record, your resume. But you're never going to complain about getting the bye in your conference tournament either. That helps you. Yeah, quite honestly, I I was so fixated a couple weeks ago and uh, quite honestly yesterday I was so fixated on where we would land and with respect to conference seating and all that and really buy or no buy it, the the buy doesn't really mean as much anymore it used to be the top six like the the holy six of the conference get by like it was never said but it was always implied that if you were in the bottom four you're in the basement well now it's the top five so it's not even like the the upper echelon it, it it's strictly based on the number of teams at this point, which I think kind of lessens the blow of playing Wednesday night. And personally, if I'm the if I'm the Friars and we land at six and we have a favorable path, that's really all that matters is the path. Like I would hate to land at five and well, who would our first matchup be? The four seed. So that's either Connecticut. No, or no, no, you're playing. You're not playing the four seed. Then I think you're playing the winner of. Wait, you would play the four. It's weird this year. Hold on. I'm going to pull up the picture that... No, you'd, you'd play the four. You, you would play the four if that's the case, which in this case would be thought. UConn. Yeah, it'd be UConn. In all right, likelihood, so that's it. It's got to be UConn or Seton Hall. That, like, if that's the first game of the tournament for us, I, I'm not feeling too confident about that, especially if UConn is book night hot and ready to go. Exactly. The flip side is that you win that game, that avenges that loss you had in the regular season. You go 2-1 and one against UConn on the year. You're now you have a real nice shot at things. If you beat Villanova and you beat UConn, you've avenged the one loss in that last stretch that you couldn't have. You can kind of pretend you finished the season on that six game winning streak and you might bump UConn. Uh, we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves here. We're gonna, yeah, okay. I mean, we're gonna have we're gonna... more podcast episodes on this in the future. Let's bring it back to this game. So I do want to say, I do want to mention one thing I didn't get to, I mentioned on the halftime show, but hadn't mentioned on here. I was really impressed with AJ Reeves tonight. 16 yeah, points. He, he took good shots. They set him up for good shots. He was, he was a strong, strong performer. Yeah, I was, I'm going to second you on that, Matt. 
I think Reeves had a really underrated performance tonight. Um, rebounding, scoring, taking smart shots. I feel like a lot of times um, he's forcing threes. Like I, Obviously, it looks pretty if it goes in, but those step-back contested threes, I'm not a huge fan of. Um, but really, it was it was a good performance by him. And this is all you wanted from him. You, you don't – obviously, the the 28-point performances with seven of nine made three-pointers is a lot of fun to watch. But that's not necessarily what you need. You just need consistent double-figure scoring from him. Yeah. And quite honestly, if we get that from him and from Horkler for the rest of the season, I think we're going to be a tough out. I won't say Bynum because, as we've seen, Bynum – doesn't get a shot unless it's forced at the end of the shot clock. He goes to the free throw line. We don't really draw up a lot for him, and it's because he's the one that's usually dishing it out for others to score. Um, but if you can get four yeah. out of the five in double figures, that's not too shabby. And even Bynum had an NBA range three. Duke had an NBA range three. And Duke also had that one late in the shot clock. Uh, they hit some shots they're not usually going to hit. They looked good from beyond the arc. And I don't think we've talked enough about Noah Horkler tonight either. I mean, we mentioned it, we tweeted about it, but this was the Noah Horkler game. I mean, he was slamming it home all over the place. He had two blocks. Noah looked small last time out against UConn. He looked like he had something to prove. That It was a lot of fun to watch him. My brother pointed out that he looks like a grown-up Kevin McAllister from Home Alone. <laughs> and then I couldn't get that out of my, my head the entire night, so... When Horkler, oh, this is what I wanted to say. When when Duke brought the ball up and Horkler was trailing behind him because he was the inbounder, it almost reminded me of a 2K play. Like, Matt, you know I like I love playing 2K. It, oh, yeah. Like, the point guard brings it up, stops at the top of the key, and dishes it off to the trailing foreman who just drives and slams it. I mean, he took one power dribble and slammed it with one hand. So, oh, my. back to my, yeah. to my original point. I could I couldn't help but think that that was Kevin McAllister doing that, so I was laughing because I was imagining him doing that in the sense of like a Home Alone movie, like with a brick. And but then um, I'm also thinking like I literally could turn on my PS4 and play 2K and do this and copy the same exact play: one power dribble, one handed dunk off of the point guard. Like that was the quickest possession I've ever seen from Providence. <laughs> Yeah, and I, it was a note they mentioned on the broadcast how athletic the Friars can play and how when they push the pace, get going in transition, there's teams that can't play with them. And I know personally, ever since I came to Providence, I mean, I remember talking before our freshman year back in 2016 about how much athleticism that team had and how they could push the pace. And that's why the Friars, that's, this is what I'd like to do. It's why he talks about defense and the offense, because if you play good defense, that's what allows you to set up that transition offense, what allows you to run and get these opportunities. And I mean, the, the Friars defense was on point tonight too. What, what did I, what have I been saying all year? Good defense leads to better offense. I uh, honestly, 68 points. It's, it's not our best defensive effort, but Hey, it, compared to what we've been giving up, this is really good to 83 scored. It's like, come on. Yeah, and Xavier's a good uh, that's a good offense. I mean, that's, they put up 99 points against Oklahoma earlier this year. And sure, they're without Nate Johnson. But that's, again, that's not why they're only scoring 68. It's because the Friars' defense came to play. And some of the points the Friars gave up later were because you're up by more and you can kind of afford to give up points or uh, afford to give up some softer shots and some opportunities. And, and I mean, this is just, this is a solid performance. This is a wire to wire, really good play. And with the exception of that win at UConn, or the, sorry, the loss at UConn, and when they beat UConn at home, it was a wire-to-wire -wire strong performance. When they beat DePaul, it was pretty much wire-to-wire, -wire, although odd circumstances with Cooley not coaching. It's three out of four games now where the Friars have basically played the game they wanted to play. You have to be yeah. happy with that. Is it too little too late? Probably. But yep. we are where we are, and I'm. you know what? We've said all the negative stuff. So I'm not going to sit here and be upset after a win. Big picture on the season, yeah, I'm probably upset about things. But right now I'm happy. The Friars team is looking like the Friars team that we knew that they could look, that we knew they could be. So let's enjoy it. It's enter at the end of the day, basketball, this is entertainment. This is for fun. So you get a game like this, sit back, enjoy it, and enjoy it for what it is. Yeah, in the short term, this is a, a game to, to be proud of. You You can hang your hat on this game. It's... It's something the fans have been dying to see all season, and it finally delivered. Um, 
like you said, Matt, b- big picture. There's work to be done. Uh, realistically, you're probably not going to look back at the season with a big smile, but um, in the short term, we can enjoy this and we can play the what if game all we want. But now my mind is like so focused on Saturday and trying to figure out who is available because I yeah. think that's going to be a fun prep for you and I because we've been doing Big East opponents for, yeah, God, for almost two months now. Here. Well, something yeah. different. Yeah, and and if we don't get something Saturday, we'll maybe we'll put out some fun content for you guys. I know we had uh, we we obviously thank you to all the listeners that have stuck with us through this whole season and this this crazy COVID year. Basketball is a welcome relief from all of that. You know, to sit back and just enjoy this. That was that was just chef's kiss. That was a fun game, and you know we said at the end of last year. When the Friars started winning, I mean, those were fun games. See, you look at the win over Seton Hall and the win over Creighton. Like, they had some – win over Marquette. Had these games. So they were just clearly on it, and they were locked yeah. in mentally. And this this is now the second time in four games where it's kind of felt like that. Yeah. It, it, it's so it's so notable because the, the PCBB Twitter fan group, whatever you want to call it, it is so quick to jump to the fire Cooley train, and yet – Year after year, he, whether or not you go on a six-game win streak, he can get his teams to turn it on in February. Even if you look at 2018, 2019, which, as you know very well, I'm not a fan of that season. I, I think we strung together a couple of good games late, later on, all three of them being against Butler. And you had a very good road contest against Creighton. So there's something to be said about Cooley and his late February coaching. And you know what? Now we're we're getting into that early March coaching, which is that whole that's that next level right there. Early March. This is this is so weird. Last uh, last year we we were in this spot looking ahead, like yeah, we can't wait for the tournament. We're gonna be there, and then it was like nope. Yeah, I got rug pulled out from under us. I will have COVID said I, nah. We're gonna start to wrap up here, but. This is probably the last opportunity I'm going to have to ask you this this season, depending on what happens Saturday. Because we know the Friars have one scheduled road game left. Oh is it God. possible that we see the throwbacks? So I actually met last night when I was laying in bed. I I went all the way back to April on the Providence Basketball Twitter account. Because this is what I do it at midnight when i I can't we're dedicated we're dedicated fans and i found a tweet and i'm going to retweet it and tag the providence account i can't tell you what it is yet but if everyone that listens to this that has a twitter could go on and retweet it and spam the hell out of the pc twitter account i think we might be able to get the road unis back the 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 throwback black uniforms even if it's for one game and, and potentially the big east tournament i am going to spam the hell out of them because we need it as fans we deserve it when we you know what happens when this team plays in alternate jerseys other than the, the white and the black they play very well the pink they're four and oh the throwback blacks they were five and one yeah. come on bring them back yeah. we need honestly it. i would not be upset if the friars decided to to make pink one of their colors like if the friars wore white pink and black white pink black and silver at home and just black and white on the road you could own those colors in all of college basketball. Nobody else is wearing that. You're going to be a distinctive look. The fans love it. You're going to be different from your other teams. Who cares? Black and pink, Providence College basketball. The only team, the only other team, I'll, I'll, I'll see if you know this. So this is a really obscure piece of trivia. Do you know what other college basketball team has worn black and pink this season? Black and pink? Yeah. Is it a power six? It is. Um, not Big East, no. Not Big East. It's Big Ten. Um, am I? I'm not going to look it up, but I'm just because the Big Ten really is like 14 teams. So yeah. So I'm just gonna. Okay. You said it was black and pink. Yeah. Uh, oh, Big Ten basketball. Come on. Um, I'm going to guess Purdue or Ohio State. Nope. Iowa. It's, nope. Now, this team actually wore them against Iowa last week. It's 
Penn State. Penn State's original school colors were black and pink before they changed them to navy and white. Are you serious? Is yeah. that their throwback? Yeah, their throwback is a black and pink uniform for basketball they wear every once in a while. Penn State throwback. Yeah. So they wore them against Iowa the last game. I think I don't know if it's the last game out, so last time I saw them play. It's just it's very simple. It's just a black base uniform with pink lettering, pink stripes. Oh, yeah. those are nice. Yeah. So I mean, it's it, it's the Friars and the Nittany Lions competing for black and pink, and I think the Friars could take that one. I I think so too. Uh, I'm actually I'm going live. This is not the tweet I was referring to, but I am going to tweet at them right now. They wrote on Wednesdays we wear pink. Um, yep. so next I'm Wednesday gonna, we play. That that's exactly what I'm I'm gonna just stay tuned. Um, it's 11:48 right now, so probably around. 11.55. Whenever we log off this, I'm going to send the tweet. So tomorrow morning when you're all listening to this, please go and retweet it. If you really want to see the black throwback jerseys back, help us spam the Friars Twitter account. I yeah. know they love fans and they will listen to the fans. Yeah, we got to, as, a, as an, a fan base, we got to tell them we want the pink uniforms and we want the black and white throwbacks. That's all we want. Give us those yep. for the rest of this season. All right, I think... We, we've spent a lot, a lot of time talking about uniforms at this point. I think it's a good point to cap things off. Who, who's your game ball going to tonight? The role players. I like it. Uh, I like. It. I'm a bit. I'm, I'm. I'm turning into like one of those multi-person team balls, um, and I think that's a good sign because if there are so many o- overwhelming performances that you can't give it to a single person. I think that's a great sign. Specifically, I'm going to give it to Horkler. He gets to hold the ball, and then Reeves and Bynum will stand with each a hand on the ball. But Horkler gets to hold it by himself. All right. Um, I like it. I like it. I don't need I'm to explain go, why. I'm going to go David Duke here just inches away from a triple-double. 18 points. He's been. He's had a tough time recently. He got his shots that he wanted. He hit the shots tonight. And was all around the ball. Clean effort. Not a lot of turnovers. Nine assists. I mean, he did it all. This is the kind of performance that you really wanted to see from him. The bounce back game that we've been wanting for a while. He looked like he, he knew there's NBA scouts watching. And he wanted to show off, show off for him. So, I mean, you get this David Duke for the rest of the season. The Friars are going to be in great shape. I'll give you the last word, Joe. And then we'll sign off. Whew. Um, I'd love Horkler to come back next year. I'll just say that much. <laughs> that would be a dream. If he keeps playing like this, I mean, you can r- run it back with everybody. Bring them all back. But, I would like that. Yeah, i take that. But for now, Friars sitting at 12 and 11, 8 and 9 in Big East. Play fresh off this 83 to 68 win over Xavier. At the moment, the next scheduled game is at St. John's next Wednesday, 7 p.m. on CBS Sports Network. Friars looking to avenge an 11-point loss at home to the Johnnies earlier this year. But we may have a game scheduled between now and then this weekend. So we'll have to stay on the newswire about that one. And to go with that, I mean, I think you'll you'll be getting some content out of us this weekend. So stay up to date on our Twitter feed. Go check out Joe's feed at Joe Howie for the tweets he mentioned. Mine at Matt St. Dream just for fun. I think I like to think I put good tweets out there. And make sure you check out at the Flex Hoops. That's our official podcast account. That's where you'll get the news about future episodes and any of the fun stuff we're doing. Uh, it, it does currently have Noah Horkler as the profile picture, and it does say the Flex and Noah Horkler podcast as the title. That's, that, <laughs> is the right that. Yeah, that is the right <laughs> account. We stand Noah Horkler in this house. So make sure if, if that's what you see, you're in the right place. You're not, you're not lost. You're there, and you're welcome at any point. Uh, and if anybody has any thoughts, questions, comments, concerns you want to direct to us, feel free to send them. We'll, we'd love to interact with you guys. Anything you want to send us that we can mention on the next show, send it our way. We're all ears on that. But for now, for Joe Howie, I am Matt St. Jean. Thank you for listening. Go Friars.